I can to start. Dear colleague, I am glad to, despite the difficult time of the COVID pandemic, we are able to conduct an important and informative webinar on research and experimental models for peripheral nerve reconstruction. I would like to present to you European and North American leaders in peripheral nerve research, much devoted development and understanding of research models for investigation and treatment of peripheral nerve injury. Is Professor Kirsten Harstedt Tallini from Hanover University, is Professor Rajit Midha from Calgary University, and Professor Christine Radke from Vienna University. It's uh, the first lecture of our webinar is dedicated to experimental animal models for peripheral nerve reconstruction. It's okay? Maria. You see it's a presentation, I'm sorry. Ah. Anna, is she is he correct? You see presentation? On yes, the... it's perfect. Perfect. It's this perfect. Is... This is program of our webinar. We have four presentations and from topics, and uh, I believe this will be successful for audience. This is first presentation, experimental animal models for peripheral nerve reconstruction. The purpose of this presentation is to address the experimental animal models for peripheral nerve reconstruction, this red mouse, rabbit, pig, sheep, and monkey to provide knowledge of advantages and disadvantages of different animal models for peripheral nerve research, which may significantly aid in preparation of the study, to provide better understanding of the nerve research aim, and as a result, to proof of concept and well-organized preclinical study. To provide examples of several accepted nerve tube scaffolds, including duration, since surgery until acceptance of study results, which may also assist in preparation of nerve reconstructive scientific experiment. It's important to understand the race of peripheral nerve regeneration. Peripheral nerve regeneration is dependent. It's very well known that for human, it's approximately one millimeter growth of nerve axon per day. In dog, it's approximately three millimeter per day for sensory e axons. In cat, it's four millimeter growth axon per day. And in rabbit, it's approximately near three millimeter for motor and more than four millimeter for sensory axons growth. And in red, it's also from three to 4.7 millimeter growth per day. In mouse, it's approximately 1.5 to 2 millimeter per day. Importance also for model understanding of critical nerve gap or critical, critically sized defect is definition as nerve gap over which recovery would not occur without some form or the form of nerve grafting or bridging. In human, in human is a critically sized defect is 30, 40 millimeter. In pigs, approximately 40 millimeter. In, monkey, in monkeys, 30 millimeter. Also in rabbit is 30 millimeter. And in rats, it's between 10 to 15 millimeter. It's been, this is the fact that axon can to grow from proximal side to distal side. More than this distance is uh, problematic or it's impossible. Animal models for nerve regeneration in the literature is the most amount of the animals that would use in, in experience of the animals is what rest. 78% of the experience and research on peripheral nerve injury was done on the rest model. 12% was done on the rabbit. And the a monkey is a 2%, a sheep is also 2%, and the, and the Dogs and rats is also a small amount. And sheep, it, sheep only 2% also. 
Advantages and disadvantages of different animal models in peripheral nerve research is very important for decision. What kind of model you want to prepare? What way? What your scientific way? What your uh, aims in this way? As uh, we start from red model, it's most acceptable model. A red model advantages of this model. Reds are simple to handle and car for easily investigate using intraoperative anesthetic. In contrast, for large animals, we need use in inhalation anesthetics. Resistant to surgical infections. If for investigation, all kinds of assessment is good for him. Electrophysiology, functional assessment, muscle and nerve morphology. Rats have a low unit cost and low car cost if compared with another models, animal models. Of course, walking trunk is also a, a positive and important that's not impossible in large animals. And laboratory evaluation and recovery is widely described and reproducible. Disadvantages of the red model is small site and is specific neurobiological regenerative profile, small gap compared with target human nerve lesion and their axotomy in rest undergoes complete recovery that is not occurred in human injuries. It's again, in human, in rest possibility, complete recovery in compare with human beings. This is not so ideal a model for a investigation and for decision if it's good for human being or not. But maybe possible to learn from experimental model of the rest. The rate of uh, peripheral axonal regeneration is slower in humans than in rodents, and majority uh, they used a gap of 10 millimeter or less. But in last uh, few years, many groups start to use gap until 50 millimeter. Uh, model acceptable model, more acceptable model in rats is sciatic nerve. Of course, possible to do research also in publication in media and in other nerve. But sciatic nerve of the rats is good model of, for peripheral nerve injury. It's uh, for it's first of all, what kind of uh, reconstructive models? First of all, gold standard model. This is autologous nerve graft. After transection of a uh, sciatic nerve, we reverse this nerve and suture up a, a proximal and distal part. And of course, a, a different kind of a hollow tube from commercial tubes is uh, for nerve reconstruction. Uh, this is a model of uh, autologous nerve graft. It's a defect 15 millimeter, and this is three months after reconstructive surgery. This is autologous nerve, it's look vision. You see here place of the suture, and this is place of the suture. It's three months after a reconstructive uh, gold standard procedure. This is tube, it's, uh, in this case, this collagen tube, also for reconnection. It's also a connection of a, of a defect in 15 millimeter in the rest. The tubes, the parts of the research are used empty tube. Part of the research is the tube is good also for all kinds of medication or new methodology or different kind of neurogel possible to field into the, in the into tube and investigate what happened during the regeneration in compare with empty tube and compare with autologous or gold standard procedure. Uh, today, more than uh, 12 commercial tubes is, uh, I have a FDA, a FDA approval, approval for, for reconstructive surgery. This is a few examples of the tube. This is a polyglycolic acid tube. It's uh, for reconnection. This is three months after surgery. This is the growth of the uh, nerve through the tube. And uh, this is tube is a, a, a dense tube. It's for this is a part of the problem for a using of 10 zero suture because densis, density of the tube alone. This is another example with Hitozan tube. This is the tube is a friendly tube. It's a, possible to look very well in proximal and distal parts of the end a, a reposition of this nerve. And this is example of experimental study. It's uh, three months after 10 millimeter reconnection. It's new growth of the nerve through the uh, Hitozan tube. Another experiment, this is with collagen tube. 
collagen tube uh, in this this is model uh, we used uh, a, a defect 15 millimeter and reconnect this collagen tube and also empty tube but we also use the narrow gel is called guiding regenerative gel and the four months after surgery you see new growth of the nerve through the defect and the uh, also histological picture was uh, positive uh, in, in compare with the uh, part of the rest with empty tube have collapse and the fibrous tissue into the tube. A new direction is a uh, develop of a decellularized nerve, uh, nerve because today is many publication uh, and the many groups start to investigate with a different kind of decellularized nerve uh, from uh, uh, this is our experience. This is autologous gold standard nerve. A transplantation is a, a, and this is a, 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 a decellularized, decellularized nerve. This is the histology of intact nerve, and this is decellularized nerve. And three months after surgery, we receive good vascularization in autologous gold standard, also vascularization in the decellularized, and also narrow filament in the decellularized nerve graph. Next model is mouse model. Advantages of mouse model. Transgenic models, mouse models, allow more detailed understanding of neurobiology of the generation. Transgenic muscle model used for transgenic technology in the last 15 years. Transgenic muscle model offer new leaf imaging possibility by expressing fluorescent chromophores in their axons. The advantages of this model is study of axonal regeneration in gap longest than 13 millimeter is not possible due to small device of the mouse. Rabbit model. Rabbit model is uh, a, a, in the last period is growth in out of the paper regarding great model because red, rabbit model, model is one of the more frequently used large animal species for peripheral and cranial nerve research. Possible to receive gaps between two to 50 millimeter a represented human condition in case of chronic injury with reconstruction is big a, a chronic and big gaps. And regeneration capacity has usually been assessed by nervomorphometry and the electrophysiological analysis. The advantages of this rabbit model is muscle function differs from humans because rest is hopping and hind limb, more expensive to purchase and maintain than rodents, more difficult to car, so the small rodents and autotomy. Because this is model is uh, uh, imitated a uh, human model, uh, I will be talk more about this model, different possibility of this model. First of all, in literature, what kind, what uh, gender more used in experimental? 49% of the rabbits was a, a male and 22% was female. Uh, the nerves that used in rabies research is sciatic nerve 47%, but tibial 8 and perineal 26 together is a huge amount of the nerves that used for peripheral nerve research models in rabies. Gap length is what the, the more and more research start to investigate gap length more than 20 millimeter gap. It's 28% of the research was done on the gap more than 20 millimeter distance between proximal and distal part. Type of the rabbits used to generate New Zealand rabbits, 65% of the experience was done on New Zealand rabbit. And complication rate. Complication rate by literature was 30% of the animal. 30%. If we investigate what is 30%, we will be found that 66% of the complication was in the male rabbits. In female, only 16%. It means female rabbit is better for research than, uh, than a male. And what this is complication uh, is what happened in uh, this uh, rabbits mortality, ulcer, inflammation. But 29% of rabbits have autotomy. This is example for literature, a lack of the rabbits with autotomy after peripheral nerve injury, sciatic nerve. 
is a we modified model, a, a model of sciatic nerve injury to, uh, is possibility to avoid amputation to what mortality of this a, a, a extremity. The model is very simple. This is sciatic nerve of the rest. This is peroneal, peroneal nerve, this is tibial nerve. The nerve was separate. And for reconstructive surgery, we use only tibial nerve or tibial portion with tibial nerve. And pre preservation of peroneal portion of the sciatic nerve preserves sen sensation in the dorsal part of the foot and thereby prevents autophagy. Very difficult to eat his leg if his heel is have sensation of the dorsal part of the, of, the, of the foot. And this is model of recollection, 26 millimeters is our work together with Houston. It's a, a proximal and distal pulse was reconnected by tube. This preservation of peroneal nerve. It's a, it does the literature is also, it's, it's a, using tubes from uh, hitosan tubes and fast response from hitosan tubes possibly receive electrophysiological response after three months. Best positive response after reconstruction is empty tube. This is different kind of research a uh, publication on peripheral uh, 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 nerve uh, models in rabbit in, uh, in the rabbits. And uh, also if it's publication with uh, delay or critical nerve gap injury is also Christina experience with with and no, no, sorry this is is most of the model with a reconstruction of critical nerve gap is only after five or more months possible receive signs of morphological recovery. It's, this is our model of chronic. A rabbit peripheral nerve. It's been, this is delay injury because uh, this is model is human relevant study. This is sciatic nerve, same kind of surgery with preservation of uh, peroneal nerve. Sciatic nerve was reconnected uh, by a collagen tube, a 20, 10, 25 millimeter gap distance between proximal and distal. This uh, surgery have two, uh, two steps. First step, it was complete transection and removal of the segment sciatic nerve. We wait four weeks and that but leg was completely paralyzed. And after, after nine weeks, we reconnect nerves uh, with a uh, tube. In part of the, it was empty tube. And we also here, we use modified antibiotic guiding regenerative gel for nerve reconstruction and follow up for 31 weeks. After 31 weeks of reconstruction, we found it's a, a, it's a significant improvement in a, a group with using of antibiotic guiding regenerative gel into tube in compare with autologous and of course, especially with empty nerve tube. And this is histology. Also in empty tube, 25 millimeter possible receive regeneration in rapid model. But if you compare both group, you see significant uh, increasing of narrow filaments in the treatment group. And rabbit model of delay of chronic peripheral nerve injury with massive loss defect represents the human condition, a chronic and large scale. Another model at the dogs and cats model. Advantages dog and cats have been used for nerve regeneration study until gap for to 90 millimeter. The most common method is uh, morphometric, but possible electrophysiology, of course, walking track analysis possible to do. And the dog uh, also successfully trained. But disadvantages of this and this growth and growth is increasing ethical concern using dogs and cats in medical research because they are common domestic animals. And also both special, expensive, and precious in maintenance. Ship model. Ship model is an uh, interesting, a good model, right? Because a similar nerve size and rate of regeneration when compared to human, one. Second, median and facial nerves are most investigated in ship model. Peripheral nerve is more similar to human nerve in histomorphological studies. And median nerve in the ship is same diameter like ulnar nerve in the wrist in humans. 
In terms of cost, the amount of money needed to purchase and houses and fuel feed ships is uh, reasonably compared with other large animals. Narrow generation can be used by electrophysiology and histology, of course, even against chemistry and morphometry. And delay repair could be explored in experimental models that are close to human condition. The study of neural regeneration achieved may represent an important step to preclinical application in humans. The advantages of this model is behavioral study are not applicable. Minimum time point is uh, six months or more for regeneration. And this, this is also completely she, uh, Christine published also a shape model, but it, most of the model is a, a minimum six months, uh, 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 at least for uh, a loss accent to regenerate and the partial publication also necessary 18 months for follow up because it's continuing. Swine model. Spine model are close to humans in regards to biology and physiology. To have the most suitable anatomy for trauma studies of the facial nerve. Investigation of large nerve loss is possible. Nerve graft until nine centimeter is possible. And also open new field investigation of neuropathic pain. Where there are no studies using the sural nerve in the peak model. Primate model. Advantages of primate is large mammals like monkeys have is uh, possible for receive uh, uh, investigate gaps up to 60 millimeters because uh, it's, uh, it's very similar to human being, also humans and non-human non primates. And uh, it's a uh, had been considered as an appropriate state before human experimentation. Disadvantages of a monkey a model is ethical debate on use of non-human primates in medical research. Limited study using non-human primates have been reported. And study in monkeys are limited by extremely high cost related to animal car and a possibility for complexity of training for functional testing. This is a literature regarding a, a, a reconstructive procedure in monkey. It's a, using a, in the it's a gap defect. And conclusion, peripheral nerve generation study have been conducted on various species. No distant animal species meets all the requirements for an ideal animal models. Each model has benefits a drawback when used in experimental study of their injury. The choice of most appropriate animal model for the specific experiment is of high importance, taking into consideration the research aim and budget. Thank you very much for your consideration. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Shimon. That was great. Um, maybe. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, if they want to have any questions for the panelists, please put them in the chat box and we can ask those questions. And perhaps uh, if there's none for the time being, we can switch over to the next presenter and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some time for discussion at the end as well. Ashima, did you want to make any comments on any of the other panelists at this point? Okay. So why don't we switch over? I, is, is, is Kirsten next? Uh, I think I should be next, thank you. I have the other device for sharing my screen. So I hope this will work. Looks okay to me. Yes, looks great. Okay, um, thank you very much. So um, thank you, Shimon, for, for this uh, initial talk. And actually I will just, uh, go ahead with the, with some of the same thoughts. Um, so how can we have meaningful experiments and peripheral nerve reach, uh, research, meaningful in terms of uh, what is really good for, uh, for translation into the clinics? And uh, so now I hope I can also, Oop. yeah. 
Um, so with this, actually, um, I assume that, that the today's audience and panelists will mostly agree that only in vivo studies uh, will deliver preclinical results with potential translational impact. But I want to show you this diagram, actually, because it nicely illustrates also why this is the case. Um, this um, diagram also takes into account that we should um, have the ethical considerations and that we have more and more restrictions also in the use of animals uh, for scientific purposes. And um, so we always have to calculate a little bit what is ethical concern and what will really help in the future and will deliver um, good translational results. What we see here is that due to the anatomical complexity um, of the peripheral nervous system, the um, experimental data with high translational value can only be generated um, in vivo. And you see this here um, on the upper top level of this stair-step model. Um, but we also have always to consider that while in vivo models could represent the highest similarity to even clinical questions uh, we want to answer in biomedical research, they in the same time come with the highest amount of ethical concerns and also uh, with high cost and complexity also for the researchers. So it's easy to, to apply a crush injury to a nerve, but when it comes to peripheral nerve reconstruction, even in animal models, it might be difficult uh, for some researchers. So um, while uh, in vivo preclinical investigation is indispensable for bringing peripheral nerve repair approaches on the next level, it absolutely needs to be well designed to avoid useless animal experiments and also to foster translation into clinical use. But before coming back to the in vivo models we already have heard a little bit now about, um, I please allow me just to give some short comments also uh, on some ex vivo and in vitro models that are changing somehow uh, recently. So um, what we know is um, that actually um, these studies can be focused on the Schwann cells, which is um, critical, and we will hear about this um, later on. Um, but the problem in, in Schwann cell studies often is that they use neonatal rodent Schwann cells or not even adult ones. And then they are probably not comparing these cells also to their human counterparts. Um, but several groups now start really comparing um, human material to rodent material because we have seen that rodent models are so often used. So Wilcox and colleagues um, harvested human peripheral nerves at different time points after traumatic injury and um, analyzed them uh, for timing and duration of molecular changes related to the reprogramming of Schwann cells into repair Schwann cells, a process that is needed for facilitating successful regeneration after reconstruction surgery. And uh, their study revealed that similar to findings um, in rodents, um, human Schwann cells also adapt the repair phenotype in acutely injured nerve samples, but um, this phenotype faded much faster over time with chronic denervation as common guidelines for surgery assume as these have been extrapolated from rodent models. So already here, we probably need a um, switch in thinking. Um, then there is another study by Maya Zureckendorf and colleagues. And again, they used human nerve samples derived from the operation theater for isolating Schwann cells and comparing their acute metabolic changes to murine Schwann cells. And uh, since that is rather common knowledge, and we already heard from Shimon again, that human nerve segments regenerate less successfully and more slowly than murine ones, this group discovered that murine Schwann cells display an early on downregulation of their um, lipid metabolism. And uh, this one is not detectable in human Schwann cells early after injury. And this is also very likely why um, Schwann cells have in a human Schwann cells slow down very, very um, slowly their myelin and, uh, and also the reprogramming goes very slow. 
So in vitro, these authors were able to demonstrate effectiveness of lipid modulatory drugs for um, enhancing the reprogramming towards repair Schwann cells. But from this, we still do not have in vivo data. So we will see if there's really a pharmacolo pharmacological intervention um, coming up from this. Um, there's also other in vitro studies that have been done uh, in earlier times, and um, they mostly focus on new right outgrowth of mostly drosal root ganglion neurons. And uh, this is also important because we also know that neuropathic pain can um, evolve after peripheral nerve reconstruction, even if it was successful. Um, but again, here, there are so many cells that are um, in vessel. Sorry, no, this one was too fast. <laughs> um, there are um, so many cells investigated that mostly are harvested from, from rodents, but there is um, reports that porcine um, neurons are really have higher similarity to human cells. And also here, I think we need a switch in thinking um, for what is really meaningful and how can we really make a change in the field in the future. So from this, we would probably consider that rodent models should not be used in peripheral nerve research anymore, but they still are, as we have just seen from Shimon, uh, the best standardized ones. They have been used all over the world, and they also contributed to clinical approval of techniques and devices for nerve reconstruction. The sciatic nerve injury is the most commonly used one. We also have just heard this, um, but still here again we have to consider what how should this be um, designed for a translational approach and this is actually that we always have to choose the most comprehensive analysis so when we think on um, crush injuries i just mentioned in the beginning they do not require particular surgical skills but um, regeneration will always take place and any promising attempt will have to be re-evaluated also in more challenging preclinical models that more adequately mimic relevant human clinical conditions. So um, already I would say when I read a study that is only performed and with crush, crush injury, I will actually be very careful about its translational impact. So, but, also, we have seen a similar picture like this one. Um, so how challenging is a model that is uh, as simple as this one? So introducing just a nerve tube um, into the red um, sciatic nerve. Um, it can become a complicated and challenging model and it also can answer several um, interesting questions. And this is the case from my pers perspective, at least, um, that even when studying only a 10 millimeter repair um, um, approach, this can deliver meaningful results, um, but only when we really include functional evaluation and combine this with the meticulous histological evaluation. Actually, you see here the combination of evaluation with the sciatic functional indices with electrodiagnostic measurements. Um, Actually, the latter should always be performed when it comes to the question of, of translational approaches. You can see that this can even deliver results that um, can be um, um, important for a clinical approval of um, this nerve guide, for example, as it was here the case. Um, but coming to the sciatic functional indices um, that, that exist, um, researchers still tend to provide us with the results from the SFI and SSI as, and sometimes they do it with as a standalone criterion in functional evaluation. But we from our own studies have learned um, that actually they are only reliable these results um, when it is a crush injury or maybe an end-to-end -end, um, suture approach. But um, when it comes to long gap repair, these um, tests are, do not uh, deliver any um, reliable results. So it is in our hands, at least, and from our experience, it not valid for concluding on functional recovery in gap repair, and especially not in critical um, defect length nerve repair. So a test that is a standalone 
not for me. It should always be combined with um, electrophysiological measurements. And this you can see here. Um, critical gap lengths in rats are at least lengths from 15 to 20 millimeters. And uh, all evaluated um, approaches here should be compared to the outcome after um, reversed autologous nerve graft repair. So because this is our gold standard and the functional evaluation should always include electrodiagnostic measurements of evoked compound muscle action potentials, as you can see here. Um, and actually, this should be taken uh, from the lower limb muscles, but also from the core muscles, so we can even see a um, timeline of recovery. Actually, also sensory recovery could be monitored in the red with von Frey filaments, like in humans. But this evaluation actually is also difficult to be standardized um, in the red model and somehow also depends on the, let's say, inner balance and talent of the experimenter. And um, action needs to be undertaken to avoid bias uh, by collateral sprouting um, from the saphenous nerve, for example. So just to mention it, for studying both pathways, sensory and motor recovery, also the red femoral nerve model with a, evaluating its motor and um, sensory branch separately has delivered um, um, good valuable results, but actually it is not so often used anymore in the, in the literature. So I do not really know what happened to this model. I do not have um, personal experiences with this. Um, we have used the red median nerve model actually and found that um, the red median nerve model was also interesting because when combining several motor functional tests, as you can see here, for detecting early muscle reinnovation with electrodiagnostic measurements, by, uh, followed by the um, detecting um, return of grip precision, um, and finally also grip strength. Um, it nicely mimics uh, the course of return of functional um, um, abilities in the human patients. But the uh, median nerve model is always a short gap model in the rat. Um, and also, I think this cannot be overcome even as uh, you can see here from this recently published um, work a computerized gait analysis was combined with a grasping test for comprehensively analyzing motor and sensory parameters here in a multivariant comparison approach. So Heinzel and colleagues compared in their model autograph repair to chronicle denervation. But if the model can really reveal differences between different repair approaches is still to be shown by the authors. So, for overcoming the short gap issue, um, as we have heard by Shimon, we can think on the rabbit instead. But um, for my perspective, functional evaluation is even more um, limited than, than it is in the rat. Um, and we have experiences that also electrodiagnostic measurements, at least for the median nerve model, were not really reliable. So um, also this is probably a um, not as easy as we want um, to have this. And we need to decide if it has really then in the end a translational um, value. So what can we do? Should we return um, to the sciatic nerve model or can we probably use also another species? And we have heard about the promising species of the, the sheep. Um, already. And um, here I'm going to show you a, also a recent study. And I think that this is an interesting study as well, because these also describe when using the common perineal nerve, that they can really do something like a neurological exam and really show um, different um, different functions that are returning. Um, and with this model, they also avoided the severe and limiting functional um, um, consequences that were associated with the lesion of the complete sciatic nerve. 
Um, they show that they can follow motor and sensory recovery. Um, but again, here it is a recent study. So they only compared end to end versus nerve guidance conduit repair. And actually, the length of the conduit was similar to what is um, approved for clinical use. So the maximum of 2.4. Um, centimeters. Um, so also for this one, for this model, it has to be shown and to be demonstrated that this is really um, will deliver meaningful results in terms of um, clinic, a translation into the, the clinic. So I hope with this, I could a little bit stipulate the discussion for later um, and uh, see also what, um, yeah, what the questions will be and uh, what you think uh, from the panelists and audience, what meaningful models should be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was a great talk. Both you and Shimon really laid the field out very well. There's actually one question maybe you can ask us now, ask us now by uh, Rasan Taribin in the Q&A. It says sciatic nerve is the most sensitive at, at time it causes the most excruciating pain without any severance. How can you factor this in your study? How would you know that the grafted sciatic though is functional, but now is producing pain? So I guess this actually talks about neuropathic pain models. Any, any responses on neuropathic pain models and which ones are the most appropriate? So uh, maybe maybe I just um, actually I'm 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 not an expert in these in these models and the most appropriate ones um, I I cannot tell so I I think also there's a large variety as um, um, because it depends so how a ligation is done and with much with how much force it is done and whatever and um, really so um, I think this is the same for also the sensory recovery actually these are also most um, rodent models I think that, that the porcine model is really interesting that also Shimon presented so we have to see what's coming out from there but what is the, the best um, neuropathic pain model I cannot say but I I assure you, you need to really carefully um, look on the assessments you, you are using, not to produce bias um, with experimenter that is that is um, analyzing the pain reactions. Thank you. I'll just make one comment about neuropathic pain models. So at least in the rats, there's in incredible uh, species variation. So the same degree of nerve injury in some strains of rats will cause severe neuropathic pain, which is most manifested as a avoidance behavior and autotomy. Whereas in other models, uh, there's very little neuropathic pain. For example, many researchers for that reason use the Lewis rat nerve model because they tend to have much lower apparent neuropathic pain because you see very little autotomy. And that's important because if you're doing functional assays, particularly of gait analysis, you can't have a foot that's you know autotomized because that obviously will make your uh, functional analysis in, invalid. So that's something to think about in, when you consider you. So if you're, if you're, you know, any of the young people out there who are, if you're embarking on doing research on rodent models, think carefully about the strain you use and about uh, functional outcomes because that, that, that is relevant. Um, so let's see, um, Amit Cartel asks you, Dr. Uh, Professor, many greetings from one of our students. Uh, are there any steps in Hanover towards stem cell treatment for sciatic nerve injury? So actually, um, so the, 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 the clinic where Professor Radke was previously, and she also, uh, I think she worked with, with stem cells. So maybe she will, she will comment on this. So from our side, um, for now, there's not, not so much. So we're working a little bit on iPSCs um, and derived, derived trans cells from this, but actually it's not nothing I can talk about right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think yeah. we'll address some of the um, cell-based cell therapies both in my talk and, and Dr. Radke's talk. Uh, one last question. Uh, what, what happens to the tubes in the end by, by, uh, by somebody? I, I take it they mean, uh, do the tubes stay forever? Do they... Uh, absorb, uh, can, can either you or Shimon make comments on tubes and what types of tubes are most appropriate for, 
for use in terms of bioabsorption and you know other aspects. Shimon, you have to unmute. So we have experience with uh, long, uh, long term follow up in rest model is a hitosan tube and the uh, and the uh, uh, collagen tube is uh, preserved until four or five months without any problem. You have uh, if you separate rest, it's uh, also in rabbits after six months, after more than six months, it's eight months. I found in most of the rest in rabbits in the uh, in the preserve uh, uh, collagen tubes. Assessing tubes, uh, hitosan collagen tubes, is commercial tubes is good quality for, for using, for research. And don't afraid, we don't receive what is surprising for us. In any rest, we don't receive destroy of the tube during the experiment. Time to time, it's happened something with the uh, animal, and you prepare this in after two or three or four months. We don't receive destroy of the tube in all experiments. It's two kinds of this tube, hitosan and the uh, and, uh, collagen tube. It means integral life science tube. Uh, then another question is why are all the FDA approved tubes hollow and restricted to 30 millimeters? Perhaps I'll take the first stab at this. So, so basically uh, the reason they're hollow is because the, I mean, biologically the tube, the lumen of the tube acts as the, as sort of the substrate for the, the nerve regeneration cable to reform. So as opposed to a nerve graft, when you repair a nerve with the nerve tube, you have to essentially regenerate the entire nerve cable within the tube. That's why they're hollow. And many people have tried various inserts. In fact, some of our most spectacular failed experiments uh, when I was in Toronto, uh, working with the biopolymer engineer was when we tried all sorts of what we thought were ingenious strategies to fill tubes with all sorts of material. And we actually found that even though theoretically it was a good idea, uh, that in fact, we impaired regeneration so I think, I, and I know Dr. Radke might have some more comments on this area. And the 30 millimeter restriction is because, so first of all, there's been very few uh, clinical randomized control trials in peripheral nerve surgery, but one of them was a very uh, famous paper by Weber et al, where they actually used uh, uh, hollow tubes for digital nerve repair. And they, and they went up to 30 millimeters and uh, they found that for digital nerve repair, uh, uh, actually 25 millimeters, uh, that you had uh, 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 reasonable outcomes up to that distance. But if you, um, so that's what, you know, that's what FDA has approved. And we know from the critical gap length data that uh, Shimon and others have shared that in primates, and there is some work in primates, and I'll show you one example of a primate study from, uh, from uh, Simon Archibald and uh, Krishna Prunan in my talk, that when you, when, when you go beyond 30 millimeters, the regeneration distance in prime, the regeneration effectiveness in primates is not as good as below that level. So that's that's the reason for the thirty millimeter consideration. Uh, any comments from any of the, uh, the other commentator, uh, any of the other panelists about the the gap length for tubes? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Ratke. So thank you very much. Yeah, I want to come back. Why the most uh, tubes are hollow? I mean, it's some it's uh, based on the FDA, but not only on the FDA because this is the US, but all over the world. Because if you want to use your advice medically, if you want to implant it, it's most easiest if you have a medical product. If you have something what have some active ingredient in it, like cells, or if you have uh, some other material where you get some interaction besides of the material. Uh, it's a full different kind of product and it's when a pharmaceutical product and the license is much more difficult. I think, I think that answers all the questions. Maybe, I think I'm next, maybe I'll go on to my talk uh, and then we'll have time for more questions. Um, so I'll just try sharing my screen. Just have to find my talk. So can people see uh, this talk? Oh, looks like I'm... Let me go to the first slide. I think I was already acknowledging my talk. 
Okay, so here we go. So uh, thanks again, Simon and the EANS for organizing the symposium. It's close to Christmas, so if I don't say it later, uh, happy holidays to everybody and happy upcoming new year. Um, so uh, it's actually good to give this talk after Shimon's and Christian's talk because I'll use a lot of the um, um, background that they've already provided, uh, which will help uh, with this talk and won't have to spend as much time explaining techniques and models. So I'm gonna focus on a particular uh, aspect, which is Schwann cells. And so, um, So first of all, disclosures, I have uh, this, a lot, a lot of the work that I'll be currently describing towards the end of the talk is funded through a federal Canadian grant, the CIHR. Um, the, otherwise there's no um, uh, conflicts to disclose. So the Schwann cell, um, uh, so it's a very fundamental cell in the peripheral nervous system. It's, the, uh, it's, the, it's really the glial cell that is important in the PNS and it, uh, it's derived from the neural crest, which are those structures which are on the side of the neural tube, uh, on both sides of the neural tube that is forming uh, embryonically. And uh, it's, it, that's where the precursor cells for the Schwann cells come in. Uh, we know now that in the adult, there are several phenotypes of Schwann cells, such as myelinating, non-myelinating. They're also in the dorsal root ganglia to support as satellite cells, the, the sensory neurons. And they're also found as a specialized cell terminally at the neuromuscular junction. And finally, a very recent paper from uh, 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 Abdo in Science has shown that the, uh, the there's a, an, another, another uh, phenotype of Schwann cells, which are in the skin, which becomes relevant for our talk, which are associated with cutaneous free nerve endings, which we didn't think before were incheated by Schwann cells, which may be important for, uh, for a physiology of, uh, of touch and pain, which is very important. So I think most of us know Schwann cells because they produce myelin, such as the one-to-one -one relationship we can see here between the incheating Schwann cell and this large myelinated axon in the uh, peripheral nervous system. Myelin is important because it allows uh, conduction, which is uh, jumping from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier, so-called sal saltatory conduction, where all the membrane channels are exposed that allow you know, the ionic inflow and outflow that results in an action potential. Um, so this, this is showing the, you know, the, the uh, one single nodal segment of Schwann cell with its myelinated axon and the nodes of Ranvier. So this, uh, as, as we discussed, the, um, the action potential will jump from uh, node to node. Uh, we also know that uh, Schwann cells can be uh, unmyelinated uh, and associated uh, in a one-to-many relationship with several of the unmyelinated small fibers, which are typically pain or uh, uh, um, autonomic fibers, and these are these are uh, this this bundle of one Schwann cell to several of these unmyelinated axons, which are insheeted, is termed a remap bundle. So these are two important Schwann cell phenotypes. Uh, uh, Schwann cells also are very important in the injury response. So first of all, just going to some basic biology of injury. So if you sever an axon, there's a signal that's detected that's retrogradely transported to the cell body. Uh, uh, and then this injury signal, which is calcium mediated, also results in proteolysis of some of the and degradation of the neurofilament within the axons. And because the, dis the distal segment is disconnected from the parent cell body, we're going to have a process of axonal degeneration distally, which, uh, which is part of the Wallerian degeneration process that occurs. The Schwann cells are very important in this process. They dif de differentiate within hours and certainly by a day or two, they start to proliferate. And they in fact can actually become phagosomes. So they can, they have phagosomes. So they can auto uh, uh, phagocytose the, the myelin debris uh, and, um, and so on. And they, they also uh, switch their phenotype. So they become very, very uh, reactive and different than the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, nascent Schwann cell. Uh, and these are important, as you'll see, in terms of the injury repair response that occurs. Importantly, Schwann cells also recruit macrophages, uh, which start to come in within a few days of nerve injury, and they finish this cleanup process. So myelin debris is, needs to be cleaned up because it is, it's inhibitory to axon regeneration. The Schwann cells, uh, which are proliferating, form these uh, columns or tubes, uh, so-called bands of Bugner, and these, these have important neurite-promoting uh, proteins on their surface and they're important for allowing regeneration to proceed. Now, you'll see this is, uh, this is a very important picture here. You can see this cell here, this neuron with its uh, uh, regenerating axon, you compare it to this one. So 
uh, and this is this gets back to the point that was made earlier about human versus uh, many models of nerve injury. So even in a rat and a primate, if you look at regenerated axons following nerve severance injury, they often are not the same diameter. And also the internal lengths are much smaller than they were in the parent configuration. So after severe nerve injury, you often do not get back to the same ana microanatomy and physiology of the initial situation. And so the outcomes from nerve injury, at least of anything that's more severe than a so-called Sunderland grade uh, two injury, which is basically just an exotomy, uh, is, is that your outcomes will not be as good. And we know this from our uh, patient populations that even if you repair a nerve that's been severed, you never get back to the same kind of functional recovery. So we talked about this repair Schwann cell and, and its importance. Uh, uh, probably the best paper in this field is this, this review paper, which I'd encourage you to look at from Justin and Rhonda Mursky from the UK, which, which talks about this repair Schwann cell and it, it being a phenotype that's very, very important in supporting axonal regeneration. And you can see that both um, mature myelinated Schwann cells and the so-called unmyelinated Schwann cells can de-differentiate to this repair phenotype following nerve injury in, in adults. Uh, and this, this, this phenotype is characterized by, by uh, uh, expression of certain trophic factors, one of which is very important is C-Jun, which is characteristic of the so-called repair Schwann cell um, of, in, its, in its function for regeneration and supporting regeneration. So with that background, one of the other important pieces of information is that in humans, nerves, as, as Shimon said, only regenerate a millimeter a day. So there's long distances between where your injury might be and where your end organ might be. But more importantly, the end organ is not just a denervated hand muscle or skin target, but also the entire length of nerve, which is also denervated. What that means is the Schwann cells and this entire length of nerve may not see any axons for, for weeks and months. And, and we know that this is very deleterious to function of the Schwann cell. So we talked earlier about the repair Schwann cell, but in, in, in terms of regeneration distance, this becomes very important. And this is nicely shown in this paper that I mentioned earlier by Christian Kuru, where they looked at primate nerve regeneration through nerve collagen nerve guides, as well as nerve grafts. And you can see even in autologous nerve grafts, that as the graft lengths get longer, the ability to get back to a, you know, a normal uh, a nerve um, uh, physiology is much impaired. And of course, it's and significantly impaired with the nerve guide, even as compared with the nerve graft. And this actually is part of the reason why that 30 millimeter gap is, is a critical gap in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, primates. And in fact, if you look at uh, markers of something called senescent, which means that the Schwann cells are not uh, normal anymore, uh, you can see that in, a, in an example of an acellular nerve graft, these are Schwann cells that, are, that have seeded from the proximal and distal stump into this nerve graft, and they, they express very high levels of senescent markers, and these senescent Schwann cells are much less uh, effective. We know this in a cell culture situation because when we take Schwann cells out from sciatic nerve in our lab, and if we compare acutely denervated Schwann cells, such as in, here in the left panel, and compare them to the right panel here, even at five weeks after injury, the Schwann cells are expressing much lower levels of all sorts of good factors that are important in nerve regeneration, uh, have decreased survival, migratory ability, and are expressing higher levels of senescent markers. And indeed, Schwann cells, with, which are chronically denervated, so in this case, this is work by Ranjit Kumar, his PhD work in our lab. If you look at day 56 denervated Schwann cells, so almost two months out, and in identical culture conditions and compare them with acutely denervated Schwann cells day five, you can see that they're much less proliferative uh, 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 than, uh, oops, I think, okay. Uh, I think someone else started sharing their screen. Shimon? Let me go back to my talk, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Oh, here we are. I think I used my mouse incorrectly. So you can see that denervated, chronic denervated Schwann cells are much less proliferative than, uh, than, um, 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 than acutely denervated Schwann cells. Uh, and this has been part of the reason why in uh, nerve graft repair, the concept has maybe arisen that perhaps you need to augment the, the nascent Schwann cells, even in the nerve graft segment. So this is the first human experience in a large gap repair from the work by Alan Levy and his colleagues at the Miami group 
where they've actually used a biohybrid construct where they've used where they've reconstructed a sciatic nerve gap with multiple cerebral nerve graphs, but they've it's, also excuse us, the, the the screen is not your 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 slides are not visible anymore. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, for, thank you for no. It's good you noticed that. Thank you. Let me. Uh, let me come back to. Uh, I have to. Sorry. Let me just. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. I think I have to reshare my screen again. Is that okay now? There you go. Yeah. Okay, okay, so I'll go back. So we, we, we saw this slide already, right? The one about the decreased proliferative capacity. So I'll go on. So so that for that reason, uh, you, you know, this, 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 this senescent issue and uh, uh, issue of the, even the graph segment, Schwann cells not being as, supportive for nerve regeneration, the idea arose uh, by Dr. Levy and his group that perhaps they should augment long nerve, autologous nerve graft repair with Schwann cells. So they took Schwann cells actually from the same patient who had a sciatic nerve injury from the distal sural nerve. They, they expanded these uh, for a few weeks and then they actually inoculated them back as an autologous Schwann cell therapy to augment this repair. Uh, so this was just a, a couple of patients, but really showed the the, you know, the, the importance of this potential technique. So really the indications for autologous Schwann cell therapies could be to augment conventional nerve graft repair. Uh, they could be to add capable repair cells to acellular nerve graft, I'll touch on this. And then finally, this, this, this other area, which is about the, the uh, deconditioned distal nerve to see if you could enhance the regenerative capacity therein. So this is work, again, from the Miami group that I was a collaborator on where they used um, uh, 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 these Integra 3D uh, collagen matrix conduits and really a critical gap lens. So these were 15 millimeter conduits. Uh, so this is, this is beyond, uh, and you can see that actually very nicely in this electrophysiology data set where you can see that if you just use a conduit alone, which is uh, this one here, you can see the onset latency is much poorer for these three muscles that were evaluated. So in other words, the conduction velocity is decreased and also the amplitude is near, you know, almost zero in, if you use a conduit alone. So there was no effective regeneration over this critical gap length if you use a conduit alone. On the other hand, if you seed the conduit with autologous Schwann cells, uh, in this case, uh, you were able to get uh, electrophysiological outcomes that were not quite as good, but very similar as, as nerve autographs. And similarly, if you look at uh, histological morphometry of, a, of the regenerating, uh, regenerating axons. They were very similar uh, at midpoint and distally in the conduit and Schwann cells as compared with the autograph, which is a gold standard, but very, you know, very little regeneration across these critical gap lengths when you use the hollow conduit alone. So this actually recapitulates some of the, what you've heard already. But I think what this study shows is that if you use Schwann cells uh, in this particular construct, you're able to increase uh, regenerations for crit critical gap length in rodents. So this is clinically, uh, you know, could be clinically relevant. So that's in terms of repairing the injury site. So you could, you know, the injury site can be repaired with either a graft or a conduit as we discussed. And then what about the distal segment of the nerve, which is, which is deconditioned? We've talked about the Schwann cells not being as supportive of regeneration. So we, we the work I'm going to present next is looking at cellular therapy now to see if we can reverse the chronic denervation changes in the distal nerve. And for this, we've turned our attention to using skin Schwann cells, which can be obtained from rodent as well as human skin. Uh, and in, in, at least when this technique was, uh, was uh, formulated about two decades ago now, uh, they, were, uh, they used the same technology as, as neurospheres, so stem cells from from uh, you know uh, a precursor cell, and so they were you know they were used uh, uh, non-differentiating growth factors to develop these, and then they used uh, new regulin to get uh, 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 Schwann cells. So new regulin is a, a glial growth factor; it's very supportive of Schwann cells. And when we used these types of uh, skin-derived Schwann cells, we were able to show in a delayed nerve, so 12 weeks, which is quite delayed, nerve repair model in this case, a nerve transfer model. And you can see that with immediate repair, you get the best outcomes. You get almost back to the same muscle weight 
So the ratio is one. So you're almost there and you get, you know, you get almost 200 motor neurons that we generate back to the end organ uh, with this type of therapy. And you can see with, um, you can see the effect of chronic denervation. So 12 weeks of delayed nerve repair, your outcomes drop off dramatically, but one time epoch of Schwann cell therapy when this delayed nerve repair improves your outcomes dramatically. And indeed, if you look at skilled locomotion, which is a, uh, you know, a test for function uh, in this tibial nerve repair model. So here's a sciatic nerve dividing the tibial, perineal and sural uh, divisions. But if you did tibial nerve, a model of injury and repair using a, a micro suture. So this is simple, you know, nerve transaction repair. This tube is really just a guide, a tube for uh, aided repair. And you can see the blue here, which is where the cells are delivered after nerve injury. Uh, and we can use this assay called the horizontal rattle, rattle lung, which looks at a faults of uh, gait and, you know, faults during walking across this uh, ladder rung, you can see here, this rat is sometimes slipping, sometimes stepping properly. So there's a slight slip, there's a step, and it's a right hind limb. And then you can see there, there's a deep slip. So if you calculate the number of slips versus steps, and you get a slip ratio, you can see that with sham surgery, uh, you know, the rats slip less than 5% of the time. So only one out of 20 steps is, um, is a slip. But you can see with chronic denervation, so this is if you cut a nerve and not repair it at all, you can see that your each each second step is a slip, so it's it's very very poor, and you can see that which with uh, you know in with this and this is with acute nerve injury, you can see that this is this would be the curve for standard microsurgical nerve repair. So this is just a, a media control. You can see that your slip ratio is around twenty five percent on average, and you can see that with one epoch of cell therapy you're able to improve outcomes, you know, not statistically better as it turned out, but, but seemingly better and they plateau here. But in, importantly, you, you, you uh, change the kinetics of recovery. So you can see you go, go from, uh, and this is of course weeks here, you can see that there's a recovery that occurs early. And this is actually even more dramatic in a chronic nerve injury model. So if you wait 12 weeks now and you cut the nerve and not repair it, so you chronically denervate it, and then you do this, um, repair surgery in a delayed fashion. This is very common in humans, as you know. And now you give the one epoch of, uh, actually we gave two epochs of cell therapy. And you can see that the group that got the Schwann, Schwann cell cell therapy, you know, did much better as compared with, with uh, repair with media, dead cells or chronic denervation without repair in terms of this assay. So this really showed us the power of, you know, Schwann cell augmentation of the nerve uh, with, with not only uh, delayed nerve repair, which we expected, but even an acute nerve repair. And where we suggest that this, this, this support provided by endogenous Schwann cells could be in one of several ways. And we know that we know now from subsequent work that these Schwann cells, uh, you know, deliver a large number of growth factors based on proteomic analysis, they're immunomodulatory, and they may also hang around and myelinate some of the axons. So this is, this is work showing the immunomodulatory property. So in this particular example, anywhere where Schwann cells were surviving and in large abundance was also the area where there was a lot of uh, certain types of macrophages which are involved in uh, 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 phagocytosis of myelin debris, which, which as we said was earlier. And in fact, there was a, there was a very good correlation between Schwann cell um, um, number, uh, which, is, uh, which is this P0 area, uh, uh, sorry, the GFP area, and the, uh, the, uh, the P0 area is, is myelin debris. And you can see there's a very strong correlation. And we also know from subsequent work we did that the Schwann cells in a demyelination model uh, using um, doxorubicin, uh, perhaps um, can contribute up to 15% of the myelination uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in this model, such as examples here where we're using um, confocal microscopy to demonstrate the contribution of the foreign myelin as opposed to the nascent myel remyelination, which is in red here. So this is work, everything I've shown you so far is work in rodents. And I want to turn to humans now. So for the past five years, we've been looking at human Schwann cells. And in the past, we used the same kind of uh, 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 technique as we did to derive skin-derived precursors 
to, to, to you know, take it to humans in our first translation experience. And we published this a few years back. And this was based on, uh, I would say now outdated technology and the current work we're doing, which, uh, which TAC uh, uh, Ho is doing uh, in, in the lab is looking at using clinically relevant skin biopsy. So essentially here we get very small pieces of skin and these are based on uh, patients who have recently passed away. So these are from, uh, from, from organ donor. Uh, so we're able to procure skin and nerve from the same patient. Um, um, from the, you know, from the recently uh, uh, passed away patient. And we're able to get very small pieces of skin and basically de-epithelialize them and then incubate them and then, then uh, select Schwann cells based on immunopanning using a human specific P75 antibody and then expand them. And this is just the steps of this. So this is the, this is the explant here. You can see the cells coming out over a few weeks. And by about four weeks, we've got these uh, cells that look very much like Schwann cells. Uh, which are purified and you know by about five to six weeks we have about 95 percent purity and we uh, tact showed nicely that the explant technique so uh, was very important for increasing our schwann cell yield and he's now consistently able to get about uh, 10 to 15 million cells in about six weeks and these cells are in fact you, you know these uh, skin schwann cells are in fact they, they look identical to schwann cells based on their uh, Schwanzen lineage markers such as Nestin Ox6, as, as well as that repair factor I told you about, which is CGUN. And we, we've characterized them as being human specific based on the primate P75, as well as a human mitochondrial marker here in green. And we also have made sure that they're not other kinds of cells. So they're, they're not expressing melanocyte markers or fibroblast markers, and also have uh, small levels of GFAP, which is more a marker for astrocytes than Schwann cells. So I'm, I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes because this is now um, work that hasn't been published yet, but essentially we've done genomic analysis and compared nerve and skin derived Schwann cells from identical, uh, you know, from the identical patient in a sense. So, so we take, we expand the, you know, once these cells are expanded, we take an aliquot of, uh, of cells and then do a, uh, uh, M, a single cell mRNA sequencing and we're able to identify the uh, you know the the different cell types uh, and and able, uh, based on marker expression, and then we can actually see what they're expressing in terms of important myelination proteins and other uh, growth associated proteins, etc. And based on this analysis, uh, we find that uh, the nerve and skin derived Schwann cells are very you know they're very homogeneous. There's about ninety five percent similarity in terms of the genes that they're expressing. And you can see that based look at, looking at the heat map as well. And um, in, in contrast, um, fibroblasts are, are, are very different in terms of their heat map. And there's a, there's a fair amount of a dissimilarity. Now, some of the dissimilarity between the Schwann cells, the nerve and skin derived Schwann cells are in markers, which are important for immunomodulation and antigen presentation. So particularly, I'll tell you uh, just briefly that the skin derived Schwann cells as opposed to the nerve derived Schwann cells express a lot of the markers, which are the HLO, HLA antigens, which are important for antigen presentation. And so they may be a little bit more immunomodulatory. And this, this, could, be a, this could be one functional difference in these cells. And we've compared these skin and nerve derived Schwann cells with different functional assays. And so for example, in a scratch assay where you look for migration, into this area, which is devoid of cells, you can see that the, both the skin and nerve derived Schwann cells migrate similarly. They in fact proliferate similarly with you know about 50% proliferation over these days in culture. And importantly, they, they can phagocytose myelin. So this is a myelination phagocytosis assay using, using a, a, a readout of a, of a photochemical uh, signal uh, pH for roto, and you can see the myelin debris is phagotype. So it's very similarly between the nerve and skin derived Schwann cells. So they, these, these cells, in other words, are exhibiting many of the features that you would expect Schwann cells to do functionally, even after a few weeks in culture. And these, remember, these are human Schwann cells. And these human Schwann cells, if you look at the, uh, um, if you look at their medium, uh, and you and you use that in an assay where you take DRG uh, rodent. Um, um, uh, neonatal DRGs and look at outgrowth of neurites. So these are these green things that are coming out like a spider web. You can see that the uh, both, both the nerve and the skin derived Schwann cells, in fact, even the fibroblasts do support neurite outgrowth, but in more detailed analysis, 
the neuroid outgrowth is more uh, has more uh, branching and is more proliferate, not more proliferative, but much more robust with the skin Schwann cells. So, and and we know that there's some differential expression of uh, of growth factors by skin versus nerve Schwann cells. So, we postulate that the skin derived Schwann cells might be more supportive of neuroid outgrowth. Uh, as compared with the nerve-derived Schwann cells. On the other hand, uh, using this uh, 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 assay where we've taken, where TAC has taken um, uh, uh, iPS cells and, and made them into motor neurons. So these are CHAT positive uh, motor, you know, these, this, this is this. And when he cultures them or co-cultures them with nerve and skin-derived Schwann cells in this 2D and now in a 3D assay, he's able to show very clear enchantment of both uh, the motor neurons from uh, with the nerve drive Schwann cell as the skin drive Schwann cell. So enchantment is very, very um, um, uh, clear. And in fact, if you look at an EM level in a 3D model, you can actually see that there's some very early, I would say immature, but early myelin formation, which seems to be a little bit more robust in the nerve derived Schwann cell than in the skin derived Schwann cell example. Uh, and finally, in a, in a, in a, this is now going back in vivo. So now he's taken these human nerve derived Schwann cells, whether they're from skin or nerve, and put them back into a rodent model of nerve regeneration. And then this particular one, this is a nude, a nude a rodent. So this, this animal is immunocompromised, so it won't reject uh, hopefully the Schwann cells that are given because this is a xenogenetic transplant. And he's able to demonstrate pretty conclusively that there is in sheeting of regenerating rodent axons, which are in, in the upper panel in red with this PG-55 and the lower panel in gray. And there's clear enchantment. And in fact, uh, there's clear formation, at least in the nerve derived Schwann cell example of the no nodes of Ranvier, which is a structure I showed you much earlier in the talk. And you can see that based on some specific protein marker expression as well as human mitochondrial expression of these green cells. So with these green uh, uh, images here. So, uh, so in conclusion uh, with this human Schwann cell story, uh, you know, we're starting to see some uh, ability to be able to de develop or at least derive a large number of Schwann cells from you know, clinically relevant skin biopsies. You know, in the future, this may be important because you could take a small piece of ellipse from skin in your lab or in your, or in your clinic and close it up primarily in a patient and then send that to the lab. And then you would be able to expand these cells over a few weeks if you wanted to use them for repair later on. Um, uh, I, I showed you data that the genomic studies show that these are indeed Schwann cells, but they might be subtly different than the cultured nerve derived Schwann cells from the same patient. The skin cells appear to be more neuromodulatory or immunomodulatory and might promote neuroid output better. The nerve months, at least at early, uh, examples seem to, be, seem to be more superior, perhaps in myelination. And we, we postulate that they may be complementary in supporting in vivo axonal regeneration because of these different properties. So this is the final slide. So I think I showed you earlier that pathology Schwann cell therapies are, I think, very still very experimental, but are now being taken to the clinic to augment conventional nerve graft repair and potentially to add capable repair cells to acellular nerve grafts. We hope in the future that we will be able to target the distal denervated nerve to improve our outcomes. And uh, some early human data suggests that the skin and nerve derived populations may be complementary. So thank you, I'll stop there. I just wanna acknowledge the granting agencies. Thank you very much. I think I've stopped sharing. Okay, so. Yes, I... Thank you very much, Raj. It's very interesting presentation. What do you think is the uh, future of a uh, nerve transplantation procedure in human? It will be combined with Schwann cells? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I don't know, uh, to be honest, but I think we do know that we don't, we know, you know, Obviously, for large gap lengths, you know, you're, you're a peripheral nerve surgeon, as am I and others. We, we, we still, our go-to technique is still to use autologous nerve grafts. And I think we're all, we're all happy that we can get some outcomes in patients because we do. And, you know, unlike, and this is, some, this is something I want to em emphasize that to this audience is that unlike the central nervous system, at least we have something available, which is nerve graft repair for, for our patients to improve outcomes. And we should do this whenever we can. Uh, uh, but I think in the future, I think 
we, I think we will be relying more on using biohybrid types of technologies, whether it's using a tube uh, with, with, uh, or an acellular nerve graft, with, which has been enhanced with either cells and or other biomolecular factors, and or um, augmenting our nerve grafts, such as a Miami group that's doing either with cells or with some other type of uh, chemical, you know, molecular therapy. So I think that that will be the future, yes. Yeah, Christina, please. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Very exciting work. Congratulations. Um, you showed that you had to expand your Schwann cells, and but they expanded rapidly. Did you see any signs of senescence? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually asked my uh, research associate, Dr. Chu, the other day about whether we were starting to see senescent markers. And, I, you know, I, we are not seeing them in this particular one because we're only expanding them over a few weeks. But, but in the ones that we, uh, that we try to passage multiple times, and we know this from past work, that we do start to see senescence. So I think one of the things we're learning from this very early, you know, experience is that is that even the Schwann cells, when they're cultured, can become senescent. And we have to be very uh, cognizant that if we're going to use them in patients, that we, need, that we use early Passage Schwann cells. So it's in the future, it's going to be very important to develop good manufacturing practice protocols so that we can generate a large number of Schwann cells, you know, in, I won't say in a rapid way, but in a few weeks and not, not using multiple passages so that, so that they're still very potent. Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, actually, we have a question from uh, on what about stem cells? And again, for the centimeter gap, the Schwann cells help overcome in higher gap? Yeah, so, you know, you, uh, thank you. That's a great question. You know, there are many there are many cells that can be used for nerve repair. So, you know, I only talked about the Schwann cell, but there, there's been a huge amount of work which I did, you know, neglected to talk about, which includes uh, adipocyte-derived Schwann, uh, you know, uh, I guess transdifferentiated Schwann cells, other cells such as mesenchymal cells, uh, IPCs that are now being you know de-differentiated or differentiated towards a, I guess a, a glial or Schwann cell lineage. Uh, you know, Dr. Radke has done some great work on OECs, olfactory epithelial cells. Uh, so there are many, many different cells. I'm not sure at the end of the day which ones will become the ones that will be clinically translated or uh, or viable. Uh, I think work in all areas is good. I would caution against using stem cells per se. Stem cells can be highly proliferative. And I think it's better to use a cell that is, de that is differentiated. Uh, we do know some, from some work where uh, stem-like cells have been used in clinical transplants and have actually resulted in, in neoplasms and cancers. I think there was one example from Israel, Shimon. I remember there was a patient where there was uh, some some, some therapy in the spinal cord and the patient developed multiple neoplasms, cancer in the spinal canal. So, so I think you have to be careful with stem cells. I think it's better to use differentiated cells. That's correct. Previously, we have experience in spinal cord model in rats and we implanted different kinds of stem cells. And the, also the autologous, also allogenous, different kind and also from human. In part of the rest, we receive like apple cancer uh, in place of implantation. Only with autologous uh, uh, nasal olfactory mucosa stem cells, we don't receive any negative response. Mm -hmm. Shimon, yes. can I ask something? Yes, please. So first of all, thank you, Shimon, for this fantastic webinar and uh, congratulations to you and all the speakers of, on the high quality, super high quality of the talks that we are listening to. So my question is, uh, we now have been hearing a lot of Schwann cells being the main agent of, or being believed to be one of the main agents of the uh, nerve regeneration, but there are theories on, well, that you just you don't need only uh, Schwann cells, but you need a certain vessel structure, you need fibroblasts to direct the nerve growth into a certain direction. Um, what do you think about that? So is it enough to put Schwann cells only or do we need to have the, the whole uh, package uh, of, a, of a regrowing nerve? Well, I think you need it all. Uh, you know, the, 
the, the and, and you know new revascularization of your construct is very important. We know that uh, Allison Lloyd's work showed very nicely that uh, when you have a gap um, and you don't, um, the first thing that happens as you're uh, regenerating a nerve cable is that the blood vessels come in and start to revascularize and then the Schwann cells come in. So, and that's, that's with a very short gap now, that's not a critical gap month, right? That's a very short gap in a rodent. Uh, but I think in the, I think when you're thinking of humans, I think we do need, um, we need everything, right? So I think the future could very well be uh, either, like we said, the biohybrids in humans, or it could be a construct, which is, is, is at least from a biophysical profile, like a nerve, which is now made into a nerve by adding the appropriate cells. So it's almost like creating a nerve graft, right? <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to replace the nerve graft with the nerve the nerve autograph with a with a reconstituted nerve graft, uh, which which has all the elements. But I I think this I think cells are important. I think if we know we know with acellular nerve guides that if you use them for long gap repair, you know, unlike what's claimed by some of the companies. It, it, they're not, they're not, they're not, uh, you know, clinically as good as a nerve graft, like a nerve autograft. So uh, I would say that nerve, uh, you know, I think some type of cell therapy will be required for these lo the long, the long grafts. Thank you. Let's, let's see. I, I think we are going for next uh, presentation. Is Christian, please, it's your presentation now. So thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. So is it visible? So wonderful. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I feel very honored to be in this round and I congratulate the previous speaker to their fabulous data and wonderful talks. So uh, I hope I can jump into that line. Um, I continue a little bit on the subject we just discussed on the tissue engineering of peripheral nerve defects. And the questions were already a little bit about stem cells. So more or less, we are going from the more or less surgical reconstruction to regenerative medicine. As you all know, we have peripheral nerves and we, um, with the peripheral nerves, the results uh, can vary. We can, with our nerve suture, nerve transplantation, we can achieve very good results. On the other side, we can uh, get very disappointing results depending on the circumstances, the size of defect, uh, what happened exactly. And uh, here on the drawing, I'm sure you know it, uh, you can uh, get a neuroma as well. So the question is, what can we surgically do to improve our results? What are the challenges and limits and how can we optimize our results obviously by overcoming surgical limits and to jump into science and to improve our techniques and as well our nerve implants. As mentioned before, um, one possibility is via additional cell transplantation, which may enhance the regeneration process. We uh, want to reduce inflammation with, for example, Schwann cells. We want to have uh, support in the nerve repair. We get reduced apoptotic cell death. We get the enhancement of axonal regeneration, secretion of neurotrophic factor, and with myelinating cells, increased myelination. There are several candidates, mesenchymal stromal cells, Schwann cells, olfactory and sheathing cells, as mentioned before. But the question is, how far are we towards cell clinical products? I mean, we have IPS cells as well, and there are many, many possibilities. And I think from a clinical view, it's still a challenge and we're a little bit far away. What just happened the last couple of weeks, and I'm sure you know the studies is, that there are clinical studies out with exosomes, exosomes for uh, transplantation in stroke and now um, in spinal cord injury. So I think it might be a chance as well for peripheral nerve injury. And as mentioned in the previous uh, talk, with stem cells, um, they are very promising, but on the other side, you don't know what happened. Tumor formation can occur. You only have a certain amount of uh, stem cells which will, um, it's, uh, 
differentiate into our website we want to have. So with exosomes, we might be a little bit more on the safer side. So to uh, summarize a little bit that kind, so what's the cell based therapy, I think the definition of the appropriate or most effective cell type is still uh, very challenging. We have to better understand the neurotrophic factor secretion and the upregulation um, uh, by the transplanted cells. And obviously we need very clear demonstration of structural changes associated with functional recovery and uh, as a last step, obviously, there are still safety issues and clinical translation. So if we are using cells, are we using autologous cells? Can we do it in one step in surgery? Can we harvest the cells and immediately transplant them? Or as mentioned in the previous talk, do we have to expand our cells, which, which is from a clinical side, then totally different circumstances with regard to laws we have to use when we do the surgery. So there are still open questions. And if you look into regenerative medicine, so we come from the reparative side to regenerative medicine, there are many things which are now ongoing and you can see here the top 10 subjects. Uh, stem cells are number three, tissue engineering is number five, regenerative medicine is number six. And I think to be successful, we can't pick out one point, we have to combine things. And um, I would like to go a little bit on with our nerve defect injury. And you know, it's a major challenge. You can see here a patient with a malignant uh, tumor with a synovial sarcoma in the sciatic nerve and the resection of the tumor, which will make the patient survive, result in a 16 centimeter defect, which is yeah, more than critical nerve defect. And in reconstructive surgery, we have several um, possibilities to repair nerve. We can do uh, autologous nerve transplantation, we can use sural nerve, but obviously we have limited autologous tissue. Then we have artificial nerve conduits, but then we have problems with our 16 nerve centimeter defect because most are only um, FDA approved for several centimeters. So what shall we do in 16 centimeters? We don't have a solution yet. And the last couple of decades, and you can see these are um, covers from the Business Week and Popular Science from 1998 and 1999, so nearly 20, uh, two decades ago, the question is, what did we achieve? Where do we really stand right now? If you go to tissue engineering and to make it simple, we have a patient with a tissue defect. We need our tissue engineered constructs we need for that cells and scaffolds. And in the end, we have our reconstructive patients. Sounds very simple, but as you all know, it is not as simple. It's easy to have our cells, but how do we get those into a 3D construct? We have hollow tubes, as uh, Kiers mentioned, we need as well as some intraluminal filler and obviously some guidance structure would be nice as well that our cells can align with and use as guidance to reach the other nerve end. So, and we can, oops, I um, apologize. We uh, are working for several years with SpiderSilk. I already started with that in Hanover and the group is still working there as well with the SpiderSilk and I continued here in Vienna and we have corporations going on. And why is SpiderSilk so interesting? So SpiderSilk is not a new invention which we developed in our teams. It was already um, discovered in ancient times. We, uh, mythology is mentioned it. And Greek and Roman doctors used uh, cobwebs, so the entire web as wound dressing. And if in the literature, if you read the Midsummer Night's Dreams, already Nick Bottom said, if he cuts his finger, he wants to use a cobweb. So from there, you already see the regenerative potential of spider silk. And spider silk can be used in many ways, for example, as well as suture material for wound healing, for tendon healing, cartilage and bone. And obviously my focus is uh, nerve regeneration. If you look at the spider, spider produces seven kinds of silk. 
we look at one special kind of silk here. But why again are we using spider silk? There are so many materials out there, are nanomaterials out there, there are many uh, high tech materials out. Why do we go back so much into biology? So spider silk is a very thin and light material. It has very high tensile strength. If you look, it is as strong as Kevlar. But in the other way, it has elasticity as well. And if you use the same strength of uh, uh, steel, spider silk is 35% more elastic. Uh, if we are using it as an implant, we get proteolytic biodegradation without any changes of uh, the pH, which is with regards to the nerve regeneration and trans, it's very important that we maintain our pH. It is stable in organic solution and very stable at extreme temperatures, what means we can sterilize it for medical application and it has as well antibacterial properties. So how did we all start with it? First, we were using um, spider silk in vitro and we looked at cell matrix interaction, cell adhesion, proliferation, and migration. So you can see here the spider somewhere the silk has to come from. We harvest the silk and we put it in our cell catcher. You can see it here with our cell medium and um, with our cells. And after a short time, we can already see that our cells adhere on the silk. In figure A, you can see a spider silk fiber going right through the picture and the cell body right attaching along the silk. And after 72 hours, we not only get attachment, we get as well high proliferation, which you can see here with our Schwanz cells stained with P75 and C. And with Ki67, you can see the proliferation and we have a proliferation rate on the silk of 20%, which is pretty amazing. I mean, if you uh, think about Schwanz cells, if you put it in culture, you have to code all your dishes. Here, the spider silk is uncoded and the cells are attaching on it. As well, we have a 3D alignment, what I would like to show you here. And we have looking here at the life that is a high viability of our cells. Here you can see that we get a 3D alignment. So if you look at, we did time-lapse imaging and you can see here was a red arrowhead that there is one cell sitting on the silk. And at 0, 30 and 60 minutes, you can see that the cell is using the silk as guidance structure. And if you think back to my first uh, slide with the neuroma formation from Cajal, you can see that this is exactly what we need. We need some guide structure where the cells are attaching on and they just run into the right direction. So we, with that, we uh, explored the spider silk as a um, guidance material in an autologous vein. So we use at a hollow conduit an autologous vein. We use the spider silk as a bundle and put it into our um, animal experiments. And I would like to present you here our large animal experiments in sheep. You can see here the sheep uh, and we implanted our nerve conduit, so an acellular rust vein filled with the spider silk in a longitudinal way um, in the tibial nerve. And we had a six centimeter nerve defect in our sheep. You can see here after nine months of regeneration, and as, you, as I mentioned, it is an acellular graft that Schwann cells endogenously um, migrated into the tube. You can see here the Schwann cells um, stained with S100, so in red, and the regenerated um, axons you can see in green. And we have regenerated axons throughout the entire nerve graft and Schwann cells. And in the cross section, you can see as well that we had myelin as well as uh, um, isolation of our nerves sustained. And as well in the um, electron microscopy, you can see that we got thick uh, myelin around our regenerated axon fibers. And if you look at the um, nerve conduction velocity, we nearly reached uh, after that time um, normal conduction velocity in the regenerated nerve. So this was the first demonstration of successful nerve regenerated in a sheep over a distance of six centimeter by an artificial nerve construct. Obviously, I mean, it would be nice to, um, we landed at six centimeters. So how can we 
overcome those six centimeters. And that's where it would be nice you know, to put all these things we heard together, uh, to put together, to put some intraluminum filler in it, to add cells in it. So maybe with a combination, we can even overcome this critical size defect of more of six centimeters. So what is as well the future? Where does it go as well? So one very hopeful um, uh, material under of allografts, um, I'm sure you heard or uh, you already used those. These are motor nerves from cadavers. They are decellularized after a standardized protocol. They are then sterilized by irradiation and stored at eight, minus 80 degrees. And before they had as well some enzymatic degradation. Here you can see the nerve allograft. It's a picture directly from oxygen, so it's not as, uh, as clear. I apologize, but as well here you get Schwann cell migration, axonal elongation, and revascularization. And it's more or less the same con or concept that you have some, um, some guidance structure for a longer distance. Another idea is this reprinting of nerves where you can at in the printing NGF or several growth factors, you can bear when prepare a sensory path and a motor path. And this is the video, I hope it's working. And this is an example from the pictures you saw before, how the nerve graft um, will be 3D printed. And I think this is pretty amazing here, the growth factors are added. And uh, then you can just exactly what you need in the lens, just print your nerve. So in conclusion, obviously nerve repair and nerve regeneration is not only a matter of surgical reconstruction, but we need a combination of surgical intervention, of adjunct approaches, of cell transplants, of new bioengineered products, of uh, our results, and as well our results from the previous animal models we see before we then jump back into the clinic. Thank you very much. Very nice talk, Christine. That was great. Can I maybe ask a question about your uh, silk, your silk conduits or your silk um, spider web enhanced conduits? Did did you look at revascularization uh, on, on if those conduits like it, maybe taking the same question Christian Heinen asked earlier? Yeah. So thank you for that question. Obviously, that's a major point. So the vascularization, especially if you go over a longer distance that you don't get necrosis in the core, in the middle of the nerve, it's really, I think, that uh, point we definitely need. And with an acellularized vein, we were pretty successful. We tried to use other materials, and it was quite difficult then to go, uh, go over the distance, and we as well tried longer distances. And then we see that we need some additional. For example, there's a study from a group of Riedel here in Vienna, they are using silk as well. They are making silk conduits. And they have very good results if you go longer, if you put five micro, micron uh, holes into your conduit to get revascularization. And yes, we looked at revascularization. We did stainings with the von Willebrand factor, and we can see revascularization to a certain amount up to our six centimeters, but when it's getting difficult. And I think then the combination of yeah, modifying the biomaterial to put holes in it and something to, um, to uh, help that the regenerating nerves and the cells which are in the tube will be uh, will, uh, will get then a trip major and important part. Uh, there's a question by Willem Pondag, which I think was to me, but it could really be for the entire panel. And this concerns the uh, importance of the timing of nerve repair and what we've learned from experimental models in lab, in, you know, in different lab animals to uh, the clinical situation. And really the question is, what is a critical timing for nerve repair? So maybe open that up to the panel. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Radke. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, this is a very good and very important question. I mean, if we don't, if we have a severe nerve and you're losing the 
motoric end plates. And uh, obviously from a clinical side, and I think I'm speaking for all the others, you want to maintain your motoric end plates. If they are lost, they are gone uh, forever and you can't restore those. So from a clinical side, we do electric training from the outside to give impulses if we can't do surgery immediately, but we say in clinical work, uh, at least from plastic surgical side, half a year is a critical point because as shown in the talks before, you need then a certain amount for the regeneration. And um, it's getting very difficult if you do late nerve repair. So from my perspective, my experience, I think half a year, you can resolve or can achieve results, but then it's yeah, very, very challenging. Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, what we have learned, I mean, I think the best experience about timing is actually is based on the anecdotal experience from patient populations, because we know all things being equal, the outcomes from nerve repair drop off dramatically when you, you know, for patients who undergo the same nerve repair for the same injury, when it's done, you know, nine months or 12 months out as compared to three months out as an example. But at least in the animal model, where you have full control of your experimental pa paradigm, there's no question. And probably the best work in this field is from Tessa Gordon's work where she looked at the, uh, uh, in a very important paper, looked at the, the uh, and, and like a deliberate dis a delay of, of, you know, surgical, essentially surgical reunion of severed nerves uh, at various time points. And she looked at the critical factors. And in, in th those works, it was very clear that it is the, it is the denervated nerve pathway, uh, which, you know, which, again, the being the Schwann cells, as well as the intramuscular nerve pathway. So when we talk about end plates, it's not just the motor end plate in the muscle, it's also those fine, you know, as, as a nerve enters into a muscle, it, it arborizes into these little fine branches. And these fine branches, the, the endoneural pathways actually get, get over time, get more and more obliterated. And, and the Schwann cells in those pathways are almost uh, inhibitory to regeneration. So, so, you know, that's some of the scientific basis of why we should intervene earlier rather than later. Uh, now, uh, we didn't talk yet today about it at all, but one, one way we can overcome uh, uh, this long distance of regeneration, of course, is the advent of nerve transfers. And all of us now are doing nerve transfers much more frequently than, you know, especially for proximal brachial plexus injuries, because in a sense, you convert a very proximal injury um, uh, instead of reconstructing that injury into a very distal injury when you, when you do a nerve transfer where you deliberately take a donor uh, a nerve which is you know foreign to that recipient but nevertheless has the motor axons and motor neurons that you can bring to the to, to the donor uh, to the sorry to the recipient nerve so so the advent and the popularization of nerve transfers actually has overcome in a certain aspect this time distance, barrier that we faced as peripheral nerve reconstructive surgeons. And I think that's been certainly clinically the probably the most important paradigm shift in reconstructive nerve repair is the increasing use of nerve transfers for very proximal injuries, uh, distal directed transfers. Yes, Shima. Uh, we investigate what happened with complete denervation in REST model, long-term period. Six months, REST was completely denervated. Six, six months, and we investigate acetylcholine receptor and creatine kinase activity, and we found clearly after seven months, 78% of acetylcholine receptor is preserved in the muscle, and 76% of creatine kinase activity also preserved in muscle. I don't know what will be happen if we reconnect for nerve grafts, but this uh, thinking for possibility also maybe in old injury, we have any basis, any kind of receptors for possibility to accept it, uh, their, grow, their growth axons. And yeah, also, yeah, go ahead, please. That's a great point. Yes. And also from our experience, from everyone, I think, we have time to time, rarely, but we have one case. It starts from Naraka's publication. He operates also after seven or 10 years, patient also receive partial results. We receive, we tend to have this result after long, long term period. One, second, classification of the muscle atrophy is four, four, uh, four, four stages, correct? One, two, three is everyone know. Four stage is fibrosis, but in natural life, we don't have fibrosis anytime. We have fibrosis only after injury, after traumatic event. 
but not any time muscle completely not said to be fibrosis. You send gistology in patients who was operated approximately two years after injury, even receive muscle anatomy, not fibrosis. Thank you, uh, Shimon. So I think the point, important point Shimon is making that even, even chronically denervated muscle can be resuscitated if you can bring good axons to it. Uh, obviously, we do, we do think that that is not uh, permanent. I mean, it's not forever. And we do know that uh, the earlier you can bring axons back to the muscle, the better generally the outcome. But, but I, I would say the point you're making is don't give up on the patient. Is that correct, Shimon? Yes. That they haven't gone irreversible fibrosis. Yes. Any, any other comments on the timing issue from the panelists? Yes, Rishi, go ahead. So I think it's not only the timing, there are other factors as well. I mean, we know that different nerves have different nerve capacity. For example, the radial nerve is different to the ulnar nerve. And from my experience, the nerve which regenerates uh, rates the worst is the uh, accessory nerve. And I mean, these are considerations where you can say, okay, half a year. It depends a little bit on the nerve you are repairing and as well on the age of the patient. We all know that in children, you can achieve very good regeneration. In the elderly patient, it's already a different story. So I think uh, you can't just say time half a year or whatever your experience is. It depends on the nerve itself and on the age of the patient from my perspective. Yeah, that's another factor that wasn't discussed earlier. And maybe I'll just make a, a, a you know, an experimental comment on the issue of age. So yeah, we yeah, obviously we've known for a long time that, you know, uh, again, everything else being equal, pediatric and obstetric patients tend to do much better from a nerve repair than do adult, adult patients. And um, uh, it's it, it's interesting when you actually look at the animal literature now, and this is best in the experiments where. Uh, they've done techniques where they will actually uh, do this uh, almost Frankenstein experiment where you, where you do um, a, a parabiosis, it's called parabiosis. So this is where, basically where you uh, connect two animals, uh, a very old animal to a very young animal with regards to the blood supply. So th this then allows you to answer the question, is it, is it the nerve, is it the old nerve or something in the young animal which is important? And it turns out that in those kinds of experiments, at least in rat models, or rodent models, it's been shown that when you do a nerve repair in an old animal, your outcomes are much worse. Uh, however, a lot of that can be reversed when you allow macrophages, i.e. Hem hematogenous cells from the young animal to infuse the denervated nerve in the old animal. So it appears that one of the big biological factors which downgrades uh, regeneration success in older individuals. Uh, of course, and we can't change this by doing that experiment in real life. But one of the main factors is actually the ability of the denervated nerve to have an immunological response because the macrophages, in fact, the, it's the aged macrophages which are dysfunctional in terms of uh, you know, degrading myelin debris and making the environment conducive to regeneration. So we're learning a lot from experimental models. This is a, yet another example of what we've learned from an experimental model, you know, which, which of course we cannot um, uh, um, really recapitulate uh, in, a, in, a human, in a human patient. Okay. Yes, any, <clears throat> any, any question? Any question for discussion? Is we, do you have additional questions, Iraj? Oh, yeah, there's a question from an attendee. Um, yeah. My question is when the gap is too much, can the proximal nerve stump implant be implanted in the artery that supplies the same area which the nerve supplies? So maybe I'll ask one, one of my reconstructive plastic surgery colleagues to answer the question, whether that's a viable strategy. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so usually you don't take an artery, you take an autologous vein, which you harvest from another area. So for example, you harvest it from the leg or the arm, so you don't take it around because, and that's the point, our, um, our uh, member will here make that you lose the circulation. That's why you go into another area. Very good point. Yeah, so, so my answer to that question would be, you have to remember that, like I said, that you have to think of the nerve as a tree. Right, so you have the tree trunk, and then all the branches. And when even when the nerve enters the muscle, 
it's all these fine little branches that carry the nerve fibers to the neuromuscular junction. Uh, and so you, can't use, you cannot use the artery the same way because, because simply the microvasculature doesn't connect to the, end, the, you know, the neuro, neural end plates the way the nerve can. And we, the best way we know this is also uh, something called nerve muscle neurotization. This is when you directly stick a nerve into the side of the muscle. And we know from those clinical cases that the outcomes are much poorer than when you actually stick the nerve into a nerve stump that then goes to the muscle. And it's probably because you're not able to get regeneration in a very uh, you know, a specific way into those little nerve pathways that then lead to the neuromuscular junctions. So uh, you, know, you, do, you do need a distal target and the, the best distal target is a nerve, not anything else is probably the simple way to say it. So the another question is any experience regarding immunomodulation in cytic nerve regeneration it would be interesting to conduct RNA scope sequencing experiments regarding nerve regeneration. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody can answer that uh, uh, question. There, there is a lot of work going on Amit, on that area. Uh, I, I, this is not an area we've looked at very much. We There is some work showing that uh, there is, uh, you know, there are different um, phenotypes of macrophages, for example, M is M1 versus M2 and perhaps other types. And there is a lot of work going on to dissect some of those, um, uh, you know, some of those um, macrophages in terms of what that might mean for uh, nerve repair, nerve regeneration. But I think it's very early uh, and we don't know whether this particular work, whether it translates clinically yet, because we don't know if the same types of uh, factors are as important in human nerve repair. It's, it's, an, it's an important area. And I would, I would say that if somebody in the audience is gonna be doing nerve uh, regeneration uh, uh, experiments, it'd be very important to look at the human nerve injury samples to understand some of these, immu you know, some of these immune and some of these um, immunomodulatory factors, because I think this is an open area of, uh, of research that needs to be done. Okay, I see. If you don't have questions, I think um, the name of the old uh, lecture is a thank to Lucas and uh, to Kristen and the, and the officer of uh, ENS for possibility to us to present our uh, opinion, our thinking, a part of our experience. And thank you very much for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays to everybody. Also. Awesome.